Range of Motion, Flexibility, and Stretching. One of the most important and early rehabilitation principles one should consider should include rapid restoration of range of motion and flexibility. We often address range of motion and flexibility with stretching exercises in the therapeutic exercise program. The terms range of motion and flexibility are often used synonymously by clinicians, yet they are not the same. Range of motion refers to the distance and the direction a joint can move. Range of motion is the amount of mobility of a joint. It is determined by the soft tissue and bony structures in the area. Each specific joint has a normal range of motion that is expressed in degrees. The status of the soft tissue, including muscles, tendons, ligaments, capsule, skin, subcutaneous tissues, nerves, and blood vessels all affect the range of motion of a joint. Within the field of physical therapy or athletic training, goniometry is commonly used to measure the total amount of available range of motion at a specific joint. The range of motion of a joint may be limited by the shape of the articulating surfaces and by the capsular and ligamentous structures surrounding a joint. Flexibility is a musculotendinous unit's ability to elongate with application of a stretching force. Flexibility refers to the ability to move a joint or series of joints through a full, non-restricted, injury, and pain-free range of motion. The amount of flexibility of an area is related to its stiffness, suppleness, and pliability. Prolonged loss of flexibility can reduce the range of motion. Flexibility is dependent upon a combination of joint range of motion, muscle flexibility, and neuromuscular control. When injury occurs, there is almost always some associated loss of the ability to move normally due to the pain, swelling, muscle guarding, or spasm. The subsequent inactivity results in a shortening of the connective tissue and the muscle, loss of neuromuscular control, or a combination of these factors. If an individual has impaired flexibility, then the range of motion is also limited. Loss of motion may be a result of pain, swelling, muscle guarding, or spasms. Inactivity resulting in shortening of connective tissues and muscles loss of neuromuscular control, or some combination of these factors. A decrease in range of motion and or the flexibility in one joint can affect the entire kinetic chain. For example, a decreased range of motion or flexibility in the shoulder can impact the function of the entire arm. In order to provide a treatment for the loss of the movement, the clinician must make the determination as to the specific cause. For example, is the specific cause due to joint effusion, adaptive shortening of the connective tissue structures, changes in bony architecture, or alignment of the articular surfaces? Clinically, range of motion measurements quantify both range of motion and flexibility. Therefore, range of motion and flexibility are used interchangeably. Normal flexibility and range of motion are necessary for efficient movement. Joint movement may be viewed as the amount of joint range of motion, the arthrokinematic glide that occurs at the joint surfaces, termed joint play, whereas flexibility is determined by the degree of extensibility of the periarticular and connective tissues that cross the joint. Range of motion issues can change the way people move. For example, capsular or ligaments can result in a 47% limitation. Muscle can result in a 41% limitation. Tendons can result in up to 10% limitation. Skin, 2% limitation. If bone is restricting range of motion, it is likely from bone chipping off, which must be repaired surgically. Fat and adipose provide a wedge between two areas and can limit range of motion. Mobility is determined by the composition of connective tissue and the orientation of various soft tissue structures. Connective tissue is comprised of two primary structures, cells and the extracellular matrix. The fibroblasts are some of the most important connective tissues and the cells that create fibroblasts include collagen, elastin, reticulin, 
and ground substances. These components comprise the extracellular matrix. The quantities of these substances vary according to the tissue structure specific. For example, there is more collagen in a ligament and more elastin in the skin. Collagen provides tissues with the strength and the stiffness. Collagen fibers bind themselves together, increasing the tensile strength and stability of a structure. Collagen fibers are five times stronger than elastin fibers. Elastin fibers provide a structure with extensibility. Elastin fibers can withstand the stress of elongation and then return to a normal length, much like a rubber band. Tissues that have more elastin have more flexibility. Reticulin fibers are type 3 collagen fibers. These fibers are weaker than type 1 fibers and are particularly important during injury repair. Ground substances is an organic gel that serves to reduce the friction between the collagen and the elastin fibers. It also maintains the spacing between the fibers to prevent excessive cross-linking and transports nutrients to the fibers. Flexibility can be discussed in relation to only one joint, such as the knees, or movement involving a whole series of joints, such as the spinal vertebral joints, that must all move together to allow smooth bending or rotation of the trunk. The lack of flexibility in one joint or movement can affect the entire kinetic chain. A person may have good range of motion in the ankles, knees, hips, back, and one shoulder joint, but a lack of normal movement in the other shoulder joint. This is an issue that needs to be corrected before the person can function normally. Immobilization can have a negative effect on tissues. We can see soft tissue changes in as little as one week of immobilization. These changes include edema, trauma, and impaired circulation. The immobilization causes a loss of the ground substances, which results in a less separation between the tissues and more cross-link formation between the collagen fibers. The fiber meshwork contracts and the tissue becomes dense, hard, and less supple, which prevents normal motion. Following injury, collagen and fibrin fibers lay down in a haphazard way if the injury is immobilized for prolonged periods. Therefore, many clinicians advocate for early controlled movement during rehabilitation to help align this collagen as it lays down. These crosslinks are necessary for collagen strength, but excessive crosslinks can restrict normal motion. Normal wound contraction during healing also contributes to motion loss. Muscle tissue can become restricted by fascia. Tendons lose their ability to move against subcutaneous tissue, and ligaments can adhere to the capsule. Edema can also increase the fibrosis. There is more tissue fluid protein and metabolites in the area in addition to decreased metabolism. Fibrosis continues to increase when circulation is impaired due to age or local conditions. Edema works like a glue to bind tissues down, particularly when edema is prolonged. Immobilization also produces structural weaknesses. These weaknesses occur due to decreased collagen mass, likely caused by a reduction in the applied load or stress. Bones that are immobilized lose bone density due to decreased structural support demands. When we are starting a rehabilitation protocol, especially for an individual who has been immobilized, we should focus on non-weight-bearing activities and then slowly progress to partial and then full weight-bearing. Immobilized muscles are often much smaller in size, commonly known as atrophy. This atrophied muscle is slow to respond to stimuli and may be unable to produce a strong contraction and cannot sustain long duration activity. Immobilization affects muscle tissue and results in a reduction in the muscle fiber size, the number of myofibrils in the muscle, and the oxidative capacity of the muscle. 
These changes cause the muscle to become smaller and weaker. All of these changes occur after two weeks of immobilization. The longer the muscle is immobilized, the more muscle fibers degenerate and the greater the quantity of the fibrous and fatty tissue. We also see an associated loss of neural feedback with decreased range of motion following immobilization. There are histological changes associated with muscle that are immobilized. Decreased levels of ATP, ADP, creatine phosphate, creatine, and glycogen all occur. This results in a reduced oxidative capacity for the muscle, and the muscle becomes fatigued much more quickly and easily. Articular cartilage is affected by immobilization based upon the position of the immobilization, the duration of immobilization, and whether or not the joint bears weight during repair. During immobilization, the cartilage becomes thinner. Necrosis or death of the articular cartilage can occur between the joint surfaces if they are immobilized with consistent pressure. The joint may become contracted due to dense fibrous tissues that form around the joint surface and the normal joint may be replaced with fibro-fatty tissue. We do not know how much time it takes in immobilization for these changes to occur in humans. However, it occurs after 60 days in rats. Periarticular connective tissue is soft tissue surrounding a joint, such as ligaments, joint capsules, fascia, tendons, and synovial membranes. These connective tissues become thick and fibrotic. As this occurs, there is a lot less motion in the affected joint. In the early 20th century, injuries were commonly immobilized for several weeks following surgical repair. We now know that there are many disadvantages to prolonged immobilization. There are many advantages associated with early remobilization. Collagen in all tissue is affected with remobilization. As the collagen realigns with the controlled movement, there is an improvement in the strength of the collagen. The effects of remobilization on muscle fibers. As long as immobilization has not been excessive or prolonged, recovery will be rapid. The rate of change slows until full recovery occurs. Injured muscles respond best to short periods of immobilization, followed by early controlled movement. Adhesions to the muscle in the fascia can occur and result in decreased range of motion and flexibility. The effects of remobilization on articular cartilage. There is less degeneration of articular cartilage and only occurs if the joint motion and weight bearing are allowed on a limited basis. Research indicates that controlled weight bearing may encourage the repair of damaged cartilage. The effect of remobilization on the periarticular connective tissue. It prevents abnormal cross-link formation and maintains fluid content in the extracellular matrix. Stretching and joint mobilization break down fatty tissue that has been built up around the joint during immobilization, which then may limit mobility. It is important to understand the mechanical properties of connective tissue. Collagen is elastic, viscoelastic, and plastic, and possesses all of these qualities simultaneously. Elasticity is the ability of the tissue to return to normal length after an elongation force or a load has been applied. If we think about a rubber band, it has the same elastic quality as collagen. If we stretch the rubber band and then release the force, the rubber band returns to its normal length. There is a restoration of the length of the tissue which occurs due to stored potential energy. Viscoelasticity is a combination of properties. Viscosity is the resistance to an outside force that causes a fluid-like, permanent deformation. An example of viscous substance is molasses or tar. No potential energy is stored in a viscous object, 
so there is no energy to return the tissue to its original length. Viscoelasticity is the ability of the structure or the tissues to resist change when an outside force is applied and the inability to completely return to a former state after changing shape. If we think about stretching a muscle like the gastrocnemius, we can see an increase in the length of the calf muscle. After some time, the length that was originally gained is maintained due to the viscous component, but some is lost due to the elastic component. Plasticity is the ability of a substance to undergo a permanent change in size or shape after a deforming force is applied. Viscosity and plasticity create similar effects in human tissue. When a load is applied to connective tissue, the tissue responds with its viscous and elastic elements first, followed by plastic deformation when the viscoelastic components are used up. The physical properties of connective tissue include force relaxation and creep. If a force is applied too quickly or too much force is applied, then plastic changes can occur quicker than the tissue can tolerate, resulting in injury. Creep is the elongation of tissues when a load is applied over an extended period of time to cause a plastic deformation. Usually, this is a low level load applied to the tissues. The goal is permanent change in tissue length. Creep is time dependent, so the longer a load is applied, the more effective the tissue length change is. Increasing the tissue's temperature can also increase the rate of creep, so heating the muscle prior to stretching can be very effective. Creep is a reversible phenomenon. Once the load is removed, the original shape, or length in this case, is recovered. This is called recovery. Recovery is not instantaneous and is also a function of time. Let's use a gummy worm as an example. After you stop stretching a gummy worm, it will begin its recovery and eventually will return to its resting length, unless you've stretched it beyond its elastic capacity. The collagen fibers, a primary constituent of our connective tissue, because they are viscoelastic, also exhibit creep and recovery. This means that under a constant load, like gravity, the fibers will continue to elongate. When the force is removed, the fibers will recover. The load required to change the length of connective tissue is directly related to the tissue's strength. The tissue's strength is proportional to its ability to resist a load. Hooke's law states that the strain or the deformation of an object is related to the object's ability to resist the stress of a load, also known as the stress-strain curve. The stress changes the form or the shape of a body. There are three types of stress. Tension, which is a stretching force. Compression stress, which occurs from muscle contraction and while bearing weight on joints and shear force, which is a parallel force across the cross-section of the tissue. Strain is the amount of deformation that occurs when a stress is applied. On the stress-strain curve, the initial proportion is the toe region. For connective tissue, the collagen fibers account for 1.5 to 4% of total collagen fiber lengthening. As a force is applied, the fibers stretch into the elastic range. The elastic range elongates collagen 2 to 5% of its total elongation. The tissue's normal full range of motion is in the elastic range. If the force is released in this range, the tissue will return to its pre-stretch length. At the yield strength point, the stress loads the tissue beyond its elastic range into the plastic range. The tissue loaded into this range will undergo permanent elongation, resulting in deformation. There are two factors beyond the plastic range. The ultimate strength is the greatest load that a tissue can tolerate. The point of ultimate strength is usually not the goal of stretching. 
Fatigue failure is the point at which the tissue is unable to tolerate continued stress and then ruptures. In collagen, this occurs when the fiber is stretched 6 to 10% beyond its resting length. Given these mechanical properties of connective tissue, some methods of stretching can be more effective than others for increasing the range of motion. Stretches taking advantage of creep are often more effective in remodeling collagen and maintaining range of motion than are other stretching methods. Hysteresis involves repetitive stretching with submaximal loads to increase the range of motion. Heat is created during stretching, increasing the range of motion the more the tissue is stretched. As the tissue changes in length and becomes heated with repetitive stretching, higher level loads are tolerated in subsequent repetitions. This principle is used when proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation or PNF stretch is applied released, and then reapplied to a patient's muscles. As the muscle continues to be stretched, the patient can tolerate slightly greater stretch forces. So how do we use stretching and rehabilitation? We need to remember back to the three phases of tissue healing to discuss stretching during rehabilitation. During the first phase, no collagen is formed. The injured tissue is at its weakest and relies on the fibrin plug for tensile strength. Mobilization needs to be limited during this phase of healing so as to protect the tissues. The tissues do not have enough strength to withstand stresses so we could potentially damage the tissue if range of motion is started too early. Collagen starts to appear during the proliferation phase. As collagen forms, tensile strength increases until the third phase of healing, the remodeling phase. During remodeling, type 3 collagen is converted to stronger type 1 collagen. Controlled mobilization of tissue should begin during the proliferation phase to help organize collagen as it is laid down. As collagen becomes more mature in the later stages of healing, it becomes less affected by our attempts to increase range of motion. The best time for mobilization is during the proliferation and early remodeling phases. Many times, stretching is used as a pre-participation activity as well. This means that we are not using stretching to gain flexibility necessarily. If we are stretching before a game, then likely this will allow the central nervous system to relax and prepare the muscles for contractions. We can also implement stretching during a game or practice or activity in the attempt to contract the muscles and excite the central nervous system. Different techniques are utilized and will be discussed in our course. In order to address the range of motion and improve flexibility, we must increase the length of the musculotendinous unit and its associated fascia as well as its restricted neural tissue. In therapy, myofascial release, strain counter strain, positional release therapy, soft tissue mobilization, and massage can all improve mobility. Joint mobilization, stretching, and traction techniques can help address tightness in the joint capsule and related ligaments. In order to understand all of this information, we need to understand how muscle receptors work. The Golgi tendon organ, or GTO, and muscle spindle both belong to the nervous system and function to influence movement. The two important proprioceptors that play a role in flexibility, the GTO and the muscle spindle, work together reflexively to regulate muscle stiffness. When a GTO is stimulated, it causes an associated muscle to relax by interrupting its contraction. When a muscle is inhibited by the GTO, the process is called autogenic inhibition. The function of the GTO can be considered opposite of the muscle spindle, which serves to produce muscle contraction. Imagine a muscle spindle as if it were a thread spiraled or wrapped around a muscle fiber near a muscle belly. As the muscle lengthens or stretches, it pulls on the spindle, causing it to lose its spiral shape and also stretch. This signals the muscle to contract, 
after which the spiral regains its shape, in turn protecting the muscle from being overstretched. This process is called the stretch reflex. If the stretch reflex is held for greater than six seconds, it sends a message to the muscle to start to relax. Autogenic inhibition is the ability of a muscle to relax when it experiences a stress or increased tension. Autogenic inhibition is a protective mechanism of the Golgi tendon organ, whereby a sudden stretch in the muscle causes a reflexive activation of the antagonist muscle and relaxation in the agonist. The Golgi tendon organ senses muscular tension within the muscles when they contract or when they are stretched. When the Golgi tendon organ is activated during contraction, it causes inhibition of the contraction, also known as autogenic inhibition, which is an automatic reflex. When the GTO is activated during stretching, it inhibits muscle spindle activity within the working muscle or the agonist, so a deeper stretch can be achieved. GTOs are sensitive to changes in tension and the rate of tension, and because they are located in the musculotendinous junction, they are responsible for sending information to the brain as soon as they sense an overload. Static stretching is one example of how muscle tension signals a GTO response. So when you hold a low force stretch for more than seven seconds, the increase in muscle tension activates the GTO, which temporarily inhibits muscle spindle activity, thus reducing muscle tension and allowing for further stretching. It is also worth mentioning that autogenic inhibition can be induced by contracting a muscle right before it is passively stretched, which is a method called proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. PNF is a stretching practice that promotes the response of neuromuscular mechanisms through the stimulation of proprioceptors in the attempt to gain more stretch in a muscle. Reciprocal inhibition is the relaxation of muscles on one side of a joint to accommodate contraction on the other side of the joint. When a muscle spindle's associated muscle is rapidly stretched, the spindle can cause two things to happen. One, it may signal its muscle to contract to prevent it from going too far or too quickly in the stretch. And two, it can inhibit the opposing muscle, the antagonist to the muscle being stretched, to prevent it from contracting so that it can't contribute to further stretching. The relaxation of the antagonist that occurs simultaneously when a muscle spindle's contraction of its associated muscle occurs is called reciprocal inhibition. Ultimately, the muscle spindle functions to alert the brain that nearby joints and soft tissues are in danger of being stretched too far. These are important concepts in understanding body awareness. There are several items that we can use to measure range of motion. Most commonly, we use a goniometer or possibly a soft tape measure. These range of motion measurements are compared to norms. We can measure this either as an active range of motion with the patient initiating the action or as a passive range of motion. Maintaining non-restrictive range of motion has been recognized as being essential to daily living and athletic and exercise activity. Most functional activities require a relatively normal amount of flexibility. A lack of flexibility can create uncoordinated or awkward movement patterns resulting from a loss in neuromuscular control. There are some sports and activities that require increased flexibility for performance, such as gymnastics, ballet, diving, karate, yoga, and dance. We can have muscular problems which result in decreased ranges of motion. This can be attributed to the capsule. A capsule can become adhesed, which means parts of it are stuck to each other. If we do not move a limb, we get a decrease in synovial fluid. Parts of the capsule fold over and stick to each other. This is common in knee and shoulder surgeries. Clinically, if we see something like this, we employ severe aggressive stretching, which sounds kind of scary. 
If this is bad enough, the patient will be put under and we move the joint or manipulate it until that adhesion is broken up. We can also get decreased muscle range of motion that results in contractures or muscle imbalances. Muscle imbalances are critical. For example, we see a lot of this in the quadriceps to hamstring ratio. The quadriceps should be at least 66% of the strength of the hamstrings at minimal, but most people aren't even close to this. We need to have balance in all aspects of our groups of muscles, even muscles such as the abductors and the adductors. We have balance to help create flexibility. We end up losing flexibility as we age. The older we get, the harder it is to be flexible and the more our muscles atrophy. There are different stretching protocols that we can employ. Active stretching such as PNF, static stretching, which is stretch and hold for periods of time, or even ballistic stretching. This excites the central nervous system by performing bouncing motions. You could jog five minutes prior to ballistic stretching to help warm up the tissues prior to performing the stretch. Some individuals look at ballistic stretching as not a true stretching. It's more of a dynamic or ballistic warm-up technique. We have to be careful with ballistic stretching. The rapid bouncing could result in tissue damage. There also could be some associated soreness, and we want to perform this later in the rehabilitation program if we're going to perform this at all. Please make sure that you know all of the indications, contraindications, precautions, exercise progression, and special considerations associated with stretching. Our stretching exercises can be employed in multiple ways. There are stretching exercises that are safe for self-directed practices, such as before exercise. Those would be things like dynamic stretching. Stretching exercises that are safe for self-directed practice but are used after exercise would include static stretching, such as passive or active stretching. Stretching exercises that are used only under professional supervision include ballistic and proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation.